Today we're going to talk about worldviews. That's what I'd like to talk to you about. What it is that you think about life's big questions. So I'll ask the obvious introductory question, what's a worldview? Is that working? Where do I point this? Oh, I've got to turn it on. That would be the problem. How about that? Okay. And Google, that source of all knowledge and wisdom, says that a, a, a worldview is a particular philosophy of life or a conception of the world. So whatever you think life is all about, that's your worldview. And worldviews are important because like a house has a foundation, you have a worldview. Everything that you do comes out of your worldview even when you aren't consciously aware of it. What you think determines what you do and where you go in life. And so if your thinking is based on truth about life and the universe and reality and what that all is, um, then you're going to spend your life well. But if you misunderstand the nature of reality uh, and what life is, you might live it the wrong way and you might regret it. You might feel like you've wasted your life. So we need to examine our foundations. We need to know whether our worldview corresponds with reality. We need to know if what we believe about the universe and life and God is true. So today I want to uh, compare for you two different competing worldviews, two different accounts of reality that both claim to be true. And the first one is called the philosophy of naturalism. Naturalism is the view that only natural laws and forces operate in the world. So it begins with an assumption that there are only natural things and absolutely nothing supernatural. Carl Sagan, the um, famous astronomer, said that the cosmos is all there is, all that is or was or ever will be. In other words, only the universe and the things that it's made out of exist. And so under naturalism, everything that happens has a natural cause or explanation. Everything can be explained by matter and energy and time, uh, chance, the interaction of atoms and molecules and forces in chemistry and physics. And in this view, there are no immaterial realities, no spirits, good or evil, uh, no souls in the human person. And even you, your mind and your idea and your consciousness, all of that stuff is actually just a physical brain and electrical impulses firing in that brain. That's what naturalism says that you are. So if we look at the big life questions, it says God does not exist because nothing immaterial or spiritual exists. The universe exists as a result of natural, random, purposeless processes. It wasn't created for any particular reason by uh, any particular thing. There's no real meaning to, to life on this view. So you get to make it up. And people, people are interesting biological organisms, um, but really there's nothing that valuable or special about us. We're just robots made out of meat. In fact, Francis Crick, who discovered the DNA molecule, he said you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are in fact no more than the behaviour of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. You're just a biological machine on this view. And the last bit, which I think we're probably familiar with, on the big question about religion, naturalism says that all religion is pre-scientific, man-made mythology. And it has this attitude associated with it. If you believe that stuff, you're stupid. Who's come across that attitude before? If you believe this religion stuff, you're stupid. I want to talk about naturalism with you today, and Christianity, obviously, because I'm passionate about the gospel, the message of uh, salvation in Jesus Christ. I think it's the most important message that I could talk with you about. But it's this view of naturalism that forms an enormous roadblock uh, to the advance of the gospel by saying that there is no God, there's just nature. So this view stops people from uh, reading the Bible or even taking Christianity seriously as a viable worldview. And so the people that we want to reach for Jesus Christ uh, some of them either believe this view of naturalism or they're impacted by it in some way and they aren't ready to hear the gospel. If you don't think that there's such a thing as a God or a spiritual reality, why would you listen to someone wanting to talk to you about it? So we might need to be able to disrupt their confidence in their worldview if we're going to be able to share the, the gospel with them. So I think we have a responsibility to know, to know about this 
if we want to reach our culture for Christ. The other reason I want to talk about this with you is that young people, often when they get to the age uh, they're attending university, that's the time that they're most likely to leave the church and to leave Christianity and lose their faith. And often, this view of naturalism is the reason that they give. Naturalism has an influence on politics, on education, what it is that you're taught in schools, and all sorts of the, all, all various forms of media. And together, these give, uh, they form an, a narrative that Christi Christianity is stupid and it's unscientific and it's dangerous. And so our young people, they read lots of negative pushback against Christianity and they, um, they read bad internet arguments. And then they get to church and the people in their church usually aren't very well prepared to handle those arguments. And they say really nice things to them, really well-meaning things like, just read your Bible, just have faith, just believe. And it forms within young people this idea that maybe Christianity isn't robust enough a worldview for me to hang my hat on. Maybe it can't answer these questions. And so they leave. They think that perhaps science has closed the door on God. And I really want to speak to you about this because I've had friends where this has happened. But I'm passionate about demonstrating for young people that this actually isn't true. Christianity fits really well with modern scientific discoveries and it's actually the worldview of naturalism that struggles to adequ adequately explain the universe we find ourselves in. Can I please get someone to get me a cup of water because my lips are sticking to my teeth. Thanks, Mrs. Walker. I appreciate that. Let's just look at Christianity quickly, although I think I'm talking to people that already know what it's about. On the big life questions, God exists and all other things get their existence from him. The universe is created by God for the purpose of supporting living creatures. People are important, they're very important because they're created in the image of God. And we're not just these biological robots, but we, are, um, we have a spiritual side to us as well, uh, an, an immaterial soul that lives within inside us and it lives on after our body dies. And about religion, Christianity says that there's one true path, and that's found in Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. Great. Water's amazing. Now, if we look at these views side by side, our common sense should lead us to a, a conclusion. And that's that both of these views can't be true at the same time because they contradict one another. We've got this rule of human thought called the law of non-contradiction and using that kind of logic, we can understand that it's impossible for God to exist and not exist at the same time. So one of these views has to be false. But how do we decide between them? How do we determine which worldview is true? I want to ask you a slightly different question. How do we decide, or how do homicide detectives decide, between murder suspects, I want you to imagine a scenario. There's a crime scene, and there's two suspects seen in the area at the time of the crime, and so investigators are going to look at that crime scene for clues. They're going to, look for, they're going to take witness statements, they're going to take fingerprints, they're going to look for artifacts like bits of clothing um, that are left at the crime scene, they're going to take DNA evidence. And using that information, they're going to put that all together and they're going to decide which suspect best fits the evidence. And I think when we're talking about worldviews, it's a really wise idea if we follow that same process. But where would we look for clues that would point us to either naturalism being true or Christianity being true? And I'm going to read from Psalm 19 because I think it tells us where we might look. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. It's saying, if you want to look somewhere for some clues that a God might have been involved in this universe somehow, look up. Because that's where you're going to find it. And when I look up at a, a beautiful night sky like this, I just see beauty. I see like stars. Someone, I can point out a few constellations here and there. But scientists, astronomers, when they look at this stuff, they see a whole world of detail, a different kind of beauty. And so today I want to present to you two uncontroversial facts that scientists have discovered about the universe. I want to ask you the question, do they make sense on a naturalistic worldview 
or does Christianity actually give a better explanation? And the first fact that we're going to talk about is that the universe definitely had a beginning. Alexander Vilenkin, who's a uh, professor of physics from Tufts University, very well respected, he said that all the evidence we have, all of it, says that the universe had a beginning. And when he's talking about evidence, I cut most of it out because I thought it would be too boring, but Einstein's theory of general relativity predicted a beginning to the universe. And we've got also something called the second law of thermodynamics, which is telling us that the, the universe is kind of like a wind-up toy and that slowly over time, the amount of usable energy within the universe is being depleted. And if the universe hadn't had a beginning, if it had gone on forever and ever and ever and ever, all that energy would already have been used up. Just two ways we know that the universe had a beginning, and there's stacks and stacks and stacks of this. So the implications for us is that any true worldview, any worldview that's true and worth believing in, uh, has to account for a beginning of the universe. It needs to supply a mechanism or a cause for that beginning, and it's a beginning from nothing. And we're going to address that question now, why nothing? So if you can follow my terrible, terrible diagrams, this is the first moment of time, the absolute first moment. It's the first moment where time and space and matter and energy all begin to exist, and they exist right along this timeline here. But I want to ask you a question, and the question is, what is there? And the answer is nothing. There's nothing there. Because there's no time, there's no matter, there's no th things to be made out of, there's no space and there's no energy. They don't exist, there's just nothing. And when we say nothing, we use it as a universal term of negation. We mean not anything. It's got no properties, no, no potential, no possibility that a universe can spring out of it by itself. But we also know that everything that happens requires a cause. The universe is in effect, so what cause could have produced it? There's not a single example of anything that begins to exist like the universe did without being caused to exist by something else. So we have to have something causally prior to the universe, something that's able to bring time and space and matter and energy into existence. So what does naturalism have to say by way of explanation for how this could occur? Isaac Asimov, famous science fiction writer but also a professional biochemist, he said, it was the interaction of positive and negative energy that caused the universe to exist. That's one opinion. Here's another one, Stephen Hawking. He says it was the law of gravity that was the cause that brought the universe into existence. And Lawrence Krauss, who's a physicist, who's probably the most active uh, scientist working on this problem, how you could get a universe from nothing. He says that it's virtual particles that are the cause of the universe. And firstly, I want you to notice, see how none of them agree on what the beginning of the universe could have been? None of them agree. That's because there is no consensus from a scientific standpoint about what brought the universe into existence. But they all have another common problem. They all share this problem together, these explanations. None of them have the universe coming from actually nothing. Asimov has energy causing energy to exist. But how can energy exist before that first moment of time, which is when energy first begins to exist? Can you see the problem? It doesn't work. Stephen Hawking has gravity. But gravity only works if you already have matter for it to act on. Gravity is the force of attraction between two bodies with mass. You need matter for gravity to work. This doesn't work either. Krauss's example is really interesting. He says, empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence. If you wait long enough, that kind of nothing will always produce particles. But the problem is he's got space. Empty space is space. And if you wait long enough, it means you've got time. And if you've got space and time, then that kind of nothing is actually just something. <laughs> Naturalists uh, always, they always have to import features uh, from something into their definition of nothing to be able to explain the origin of the universe. What we really need is a cause for the universe, for the beginning of the universe that isn't reliant on time, 
or space or matter or energy already existing. So how does Christianity go? Where would you look, by the way, if you wanted to find out about what Christianity has to say about the beginning of the universe? Oh, goodness, you're all whispering. Of course, it's Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, or at the first moment of time, God, the cause, created the heavens and the earth, the universe, time, space, matter, and energy. It begins to exist. So Genesis, which on naturalism is pre-scientific mythology, it nails the truth about the beginning of the universe three and a half thousand years before science finally arrives at the same conclusion, that the universe had a definite beginning at a moment in time. Dr. Robert Jastrow, who at one time was the chairman of NASA's Lunar Exploration Committee, he said, for the scientist who's lived by his, uh, by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He's scaled the mountain of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he's greeted by a, theolo by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. Can you feel his disappointment? Okay, and is, is that just a coincidence? Did the, did the Bible just get it lucky? Genesis also suggests the first cause that could produce that universe effect. It says, God created the universe. But I can hear an objection. <laughs> I've never heard one in that form before, though. <laughs> objection by sneezing. Okay, and the objection is not a sneeze. It is that God is not nothing. How come you can have God, uh, you can have God as a pre-existing first cause of the universe, but you can't have pre-existing gravity or energies, or virtual particles. And that's because natural explanations require part of nature to already exist in order to produce nature. What we need is an explanation outside of nature, something that transcends the physical universe. We need something supernatural. And if we think carefully about what God is like, we realise that He perfectly fits the profile that we're looking for. Firstly, we need a cause of the universe that's not made out of physical stuff because that stuff only begins to exist at the first moment of time. And in John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus says, God's spirit, he's spirit. He's not made out of atoms and molecules. He doesn't have a, a physical body. He's not a man in the sky with a long white beard. He exists wholly apart from physical materials. So we don't have the absurdity in our explanation of uh, matter existing before matter exists. And because he's not made of anything physical, God doesn't take up any physical space or have a geographic location. He doesn't require space to already exist before space exists either. And in physics, time is always linked to the existence of space. we have heard of the concept maybe of space-time. Well, God doesn't have any physical dimensions in space, so he doesn't have temporal coordinates that describe where he is in time. He exists independently of time. So we have an explanation of the beginning of the universe that isn't reliant on time or space or material or any other natural things in order to exist. So we haven't made any of the same mistakes that naturalists make. God also is the kind of thing that would have the power to cause an effect, the, pa the power to create everything from nothing. That's maximal power. I can't actually imagine a greater demonstration of power than to craft each and every particle and atom and molecule uh, completely from scratch out of nothing. Nothingness has no potential. It can't cause the universe to exist. But God's power has infinite potential, so he can. And the last thing is that God's spirit, that's something like an unembodied mind. He has infinite knowledge and therefore the capacity to design a universe. And because he's got a mind, he's got a will, he can choose to create a universe. So when we think about what God is, we find out that he has exactly the properties that are consistent with a first cause of the universe. And the God explanation only becomes more and more likely as we investigate another feature of the universe that science has absolutely discovered, and that is that the universe is perfectly fine-tuned for life. We all know the story of Goldilocks, how she preferred porridge that was not too hot, not too cold, a bed that wasn't too hard or too soft. Well, we happen to find ourselves in a universe that's just right for life to exist 
when on the basis of probability, it shouldn't actually be that way. I'm not going to go into any detail here, but there are, there are three layers of this fine-tuning. There are heaps of examples of what we call local fine-tuning within our solar system. For example, one simple one, the Earth is the right distance from the Sun so that we can have liquid water. Too far away and the water freezes over, we can't use it. Too close and it all boils away, we've got no usable water. Tragic for life, wouldn't, wouldn't work. We've got what's called galactic fine-tuning. And that's where we find that our solar system happens to be in just about the best spot it possibly could be within our galaxy. It's away from the centre, the centre's bad, there's black holes in there. They emit lots of radiation and they tear stars and things apart, we don't want to be there. Uh, but we're also close enough to the centre where we get the heavy elements that that whole process creates. And that's what planets are formed out of. We're close enough to get the good stuff for the planets, far enough away from the bad stuff to be able to survive. We're in a prime location within our galaxy to support life. But the most extreme examples of fine-tuning are found in the fundamental physics and the laws which govern the universe. I'm just going to give you one example of this, but there's lots. I want you to imagine that this dial controls the force strength of gravity everywhere it operates throughout the universe. And the thing is, uh, there's only one setting on this whole dial that's going to allow a life-permitting universe to form. Any other setting you choose is going to completely rule out the possibility of there being living things in the universe. So be careful where you set it. And there's another problem. See these blue dots here around the outside? There's just a few more of them than what I was able to show in the picture. In fact, the number of dots around our imaginary gravity dial is so enormous that I struggle to comprehend the number. I can't make sense of it. And it's 10 to the power of 60. If you want to know what that is, that's one followed by 60 zeros, which looks like this if you wanted to know. And to give you some context, that number is somewhere between the total number of cells in a human body. It's more than that, but less than the estimated number of subatomic particles in the entire universe. And that's just gravity. That's how fine-tuned just one thing is. There are 30 or 40 other forces, forces and ratios which also have to be set within an extremely narrow range or the, the universe would be uninhabitable. How amazing is that? I couldn't even be bothered writing them all out, there's more. So, if you want to explain that fine-tuning from a naturalistic perspective, you have to rely on probability. And there are two ways that naturalists do this. The first they, is that they just say that we got lucky. The universe is just fine-tuned by chance and it's just coincidence that so many forces and quantities are all perfectly aligned at the same time. And the majority of scientists have discarded that explanation because it's too improbable to be a good explanation. When you factor in all of the finely tuned constants and ratios that there are and you need to multiply them together to find the odds of the universe existing just as it does, you end up with the probability that so tiny it becomes effectively zero. So some other scientists have tried to find ways to increase the probability of getting a universe like ours by chance. They say perhaps if there was billions and billions and billions of universes, then there'd be a higher chance that just one of them might randomly have the degree of fine-tuning that we see in our universe. So they've developed what's called the multiverse theory. Maybe there's this mother universe and it pumps out all these baby universes and they all have different features and properties to one another. And we're lucky because we just happen to live in the one that's fine-tuned for life. But there are a few problems with that explanation. Firstly, there's absolutely no evidence for it. It's just speculation. It's just a theory. And I don't even know how you'd go about finding evidence of a universe outside our universe because I don't think we've got the tools to do that. Secondly, and this is pretty damning, the multiverse still needs to have a beginning. Scientists have figured this out. It has to have a beginning. So this theory is asking us not only to believe that our universe came into existence for no particular purpose, but that a universe generator that births all these other billions of universe, universes also came into existence from nothing and for no particular purpose. It seems to multiply problems rather than solve them. And it also turns out that a mother universe would itself have to be finely tuned in order to be, be able to produce the variety of baby universes that would even give us the chance that just one might be able to be lived in. So naturalism fails to adequately explain 
how or why the fundamental properties of our universe are tuned so delicately for life. What does Christianity say? What's our message about this? Fine-tuning. We think that the best explanation for fine-tuning is that someone fine-tuned the universe, that God tuned the universe perfectly for life. Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 18. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty. Paul Davies, who's a respected physicist who works at Arizona State University, he says, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. And then there's this from Fred Hoyle, an astrophysicist. A common sense interpretation of the fact suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics as well as with chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces, like chance, worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. The naturalist worldview says that there's no God. But it's unable to explain the beginning of the universe without him. And it can't account for the exquisitely balanced universe that we find ourselves in that appears to have been custom built for life. Christianity, on the other hand, says that there's a wise and powerful God. And he's exactly the kind of thing that could have caused the universe. And the simple explanation for fine-tuning is that he designed the universe with life in mind. <laughs> 